Uh, welcome again, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, to our part two of the re-establishment of the nation of Israel. We are going into the most uh, famous chapter in, in the book of Ezekiel, actually. Uh, most uh, preachers would uh, share a message from Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of the, the dry bones. Uh, and and uh, this is connected to what we did last week in chapter 36. Uh, we look at the re-establishment of the nation of Israel. Last week, we look at three points, how uh, the Lord would denounce all those nations that have come in to possess and to ravage and to plunder the land of Israel while Israel was in its captivity. And we know that God would keep that land desolate so that uh, these enemy nations would not profit from the land that God has kept for his people, the nation of Israel, even though it was desolate through uh, to 2,500 years. And then when it is time, God would restore the nation of Israel um, for his own name's sake, despite uh, Israel's uh, uh, continued uh, disobedience uh, to the word of the Lord, uh, yet the Lord in his mercy and in, in his uh, goodness and in his uh, graciousness and in remembrance of the promise that he has given to Abraham, he begins to bring back the nation of Israel to the promised land. And we saw the beginning of that last week, okay? And then finally the third point, through this restoration of Israel, not just being, not just bringing back the people into the land, but prospering the land, miraculous uh, fertility in the land. Uh, God is declaring Himself and His glory, not just to Israel, but to all the nations around, that they may see that there is a God in Israel who has to be honored. All right. So that was it, uh, the three points that we covered. Uh, last week, and today we are looking at the Lord demonstrates His power. Right? It is a witness to the nations, it is a witness to Christ, but it is it's this gathering is despite all odds, despite all human opposition, God breaks through with His power. He demonstrates His power to to everyone concerned. Not just his power, but his faithfulness and his promises uh, to Abraham through the re-establishment of, of Israel. All right. So we are quickly going to uh, the song that uh, was given to us, the very first song itself, a very peculiar song by Paul Wilbur on on this dead bones coming back to to life. All right. So the hand of the Lord was on me, Ezekiel said, and He brought me out by the Spirit and sent me in the middle of this huge valley, and He was full of bones, we are told, right? So Ezekiel was brought in a vision to this valley and there was bones everywhere. And the Lord led me back and forth among them, walking amidst the bones carefully. Yeah? And I saw so many bones on the floor of the valley. One character of the bone, the bone was very, very dry. Just a touch and it disappears back into dust. All right, and and he asked me, son of man, can these bones live again? All right, an absolutely preposterous question, knowing very well that dead bones turning to dust now would never be able to live again. But but Ezekiel dare not say no to the Lord, is he? Right, because he is God, and 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 that's the wise decision, uh, wise answer, uh, given by by Ezekiel. Lord, only you alone know. Okay, and um, that's what Peter said to to Jesus as well, right? When Jesus asked him, "Do you love me?" Okay, so so here uh, uh, we are told that Ezekiel was taken in a vision, in a trance, uh, into this valley, and behold, there were so many dead bones there. And uh, could this be a remembrance of when he was taken captive to Babylon, you know, even as he was taken out of the city in 597 BC, 
he saw all these dead bodies, all right, uh, outside of Jerusalem, all the way out of Israel towards Babylon. Yes, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar in his conquest killed everything as he came into uh, Jerusalem. So could it be this, this tragic memory that is in his mind when he saw all these bones? And these bones are not just old and, and decayed, but it's also a picture of this disgraced bones, right? People who are dead needs to be properly buried according to Mosaic law, but these are scattered all over on the surface of the valley. So this shows uh, these people have been left there in, 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 in disgrace. And Ezekiel being a priest, being trained as a priest, understood that. And as a priest, he cannot even touch these dead bones because then he, he would be defiled. So you can see him walking carefully, afraid to step on any of these bones that have been exposed for 2,500 years, all right, since 586 BC uh, until today now, if you can say, and and uh, these bones have been uh, exposed to all the buzzards and all the uh, vultures, right? So this is possibly a picture of the nation of Israel having been scattered for 2,500 years, completely abandoned that land, completely left desolate. All right, so for 2,500 years, this dead nation has laid dead and now have just become dried bones ready to turn to, to dust. On the other hand, we can also see these as dead bones. All right, the, the 6 million uh, Jews and, and non-Aryans that uh, were killed in the concentration camps um, in, in, in Poland. There are six concentration camps in Poland, uh, in Austria, in Germany. So, so six million died then uh, uh, by the uh, forces, the Nazi forces of, of Hitler. I'm giving to you some of the pictures and taken from uh, Dachau, taken from Ebensee in Austria, taken from Weimar in Germany and my password this evening, Bacchanal, that's also in Auschwitz uh, in Poland, all right? And uh, can these bones live, the Lord asked? Can these dead bones come again? This is the nation of Israel reduced to bones. Ezekiel couldn't see any hope in these things, but you know, Lord, he trusted God, you see? And, and then God said, okay, prophesy to the bones. Okay, say to the bones now, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, surely I will make breath enter into you and you shall live again. I will put tendons on you and bring flesh on you and I'll cover you back with skin and I'll put breath in you and you shall live and then you shall know that I'm the Lord. So here is God asking Ezekiel to prophesy and to speak life to these bones. Now, let's put you in the shoes of Ezekiel. If you hear God asking you to do this, would you do it? Okay? It will make Ezekiel looks stupid, isn't it, right? How could you bring back life to bones that have turned to dust? This is something completely irrational, okay? And yet, brothers and sisters, sometimes God will ask us to do shocking things, irrational things, and we need to trust God, just as uh, Ezekiel trusted God, uh, just as, uh, uh, remember Matthew chapter 17, uh, Jesus and Peter were going into the temple in, in, in Capernaum or in the synagogue and uh, temple officers would normally require anyone who visit the temple or anyone who visits uh, the synagogue must pay a temple tax and they didn't have any money and uh, what did Jesus ask Peter to do? Go and fish, all right? <laughs> Go and fish and you will get enough uh, of the four drachma enough to pay the temple tax for us to go into into the temple all right peter obeyed 
and did that, all right, to get the uh, to get the text to enter into the temple. Sometimes like this, all right. So uh, sometimes God asks us to do things that is beyond our human uh, logical understanding. And like Ezekiel, like Peter, when you hear the Spirit say things to you, uh, we need to obey. And then you see the power of God's word. Okay, uh, I, I remember there was a time when my boss, his mother was very ill, and we were asked to go and speak to his mother. I was very afraid of my boss, you know, and to to go and speak to his mother, uh, and to bring the gospel to his mother, that was a request from uh, my boss's uh, sister. And so I asked Asiu Ling to go uh, with me, and, and we went, and we prayed for the mom, spoke to the mom. A couple of months later, the mom passed away and uh, requested for a, a Christian burial and so on. And my boss asked me to find someone to, to preach in the wake service in his bungalow. And uh, he's my boss. So I called uh, Dr. Paul Lau to, uh, to do that. And, and that's, that's the wonder, you know, when God calls, even though it's something fearful and something irrational, learn to heed God's prompting and God will do great work, okay? And so that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved by God, it is the power of God to transform everything in people's lives. So Ezekiel, you know, despite his uh, doubt of bringing back life to this bone, Ezekiel spoke the word of God in faith and the power of God went forth. Okay, and and, and uh, you see all the graphics just now in the song, how all the bones came together and how uh, there was a vast army that came up from that. Okay, so, so, so we were looking at this last week, look at Israel having been occupied by 10 different empires over the past 2,500 years, all right, since 586 BC, how the Persians came, the Romans came, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and then the Muslim Empire came over the Crusade. Can Jerusalem and can Israel ever be revived again? People ask, and, and there was no way. Even among the Jews, they have lost hope. But the second song that was given to us is now, this hope is still living in many of the Jews, even though they were scattered all over Europe and, and living hope by, by, by Phil Wickham uh, is the resurrection song. So even as all hope of the disciples were lost when Christ was crucified, and yet you see the power of God raising up, all right, Christ on the third day, and even as the power of God raised Christ out from his tomb, the power of God will raise up his people again uh, from after 2,500 years of, of uh, diaspora. All right, so this, this is uh, what we were looking at last week. And um, can these bones come back to life? And uh, we have seen how uh, also last week they have been scattered all over the world for 2,500 years now. And it would take a miracle of God to bring back everybody and to revive that nation of Israel. And that's the living hope as I was uh, looking at that to you. So, so Ezekiel prophesied as he was commanded by God, spoke the word of God. And as, 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 as I was prophesying, uh, he noticed there was a noise and then a rattling sound how all the bones began to shake together and the bones came together, bone to bone, and then tendons and flesh began to appear on the bones and then the skin grew and cover up all the flesh. But then he noticed something else. There was no breath in them, okay? Now notice, whenever God asks us to say anything, to proclaim anything, 
what did Ezekiel do? After proclaiming the word of God, he observed, he watched, and he see how God moves things. All right? So, so should we. You know, whenever we, 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 we share the gospel or share the good news, keep watch. All right? Because the power of God will not return empty. The power of God shall not return to him. Void. It will achieve its purpose. Remember that, especially when you have been asked by the Lord to do certain things. Keep watching. There is an order to what God is doing. It may take time, but he sees things happening uh, step by step. So too, we should do that. Right? And, uh, and uh, he kept waiting. All right? He kept waiting. There was no breath in them. You heard the bones all came together, but there was no breath in them. But God said, can these bones live? Okay, so, so he is waiting. And then God said uh, uh, to prophesy the breath into that book. Okay, so, so here is this picture, right? Can a dead nation be restored? And I'll give you a different picture of how the women were uh, also put in a camp there, in, in, also in another sub-camp of uh, Auschwitz in Poland, and uh, Dachau in, 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 in uh, Germany. And I give you the article here. A lot of you are saying that I didn't have all these things in my notes. So I'm putting all the websites for my notes. Uh, if you are interested to look at how the women were sexually uh, molested and how all the hideous experiments were done on the women, if you got the stomach to read it, uh, that would be the website for you to go into it. Okay. Now, so what's, what's happening is he sees things coming back to life, but there was no breath in them. Uh, this is still the old life. It is not a new creation. God is not creating anything new, right? These are still uh, the dead bones uh, that of the old Israel that's coming back to, to life. Remember that, huh? So, so then God said, prophesy now to the breath, to the wind, all right? And thus says the Lord, come breath, Right, the Neshma of God, the breath of God from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Bringing us back to Genesis chapter 2, 7, where God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and, and he became a living being. Right? So again, Ezekiel implicitly obeyed the Lord. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and they stood up to become a vast army. Okay. So there's the breath of God coming back into their lives and, and, and they came up to become a great army. We're going to look at the great army um, applying it literally into the Israeli defense forces uh, in a moment. Okay. But there's a lesson here. This is talking about the breath of God, with the Spirit of God here, okay? And we need to know something here. Sometimes the Word is not enough. We need the Spirit of, of God, all right? The Word brought all these bones back to life, but the Spirit has got to enter into them for them to become a living human being. I'm, I'm jumping to the end. Um, and... and uh, and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? We can talk, we can preach, we can share the word of God, but always remember, pray for the Holy Spirit to come, the breath of God to come in and, 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 and bring that necessary uh, transformation, okay? And uh, the word sometimes is, is not enough. Uh, when we are talking of dead churches and and uh, people around us who have yet to, to acknowledge the Lord. So this is the condition of Israel today. They have come back to life, a vast army, um, but the breath of God is still to come, all right? Or uh, if I can say, it is still part of the old Israel waiting for what we looked at last week when God says, I'll put a new heart in you and I'll put a new spirit in you. All right, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse uh, 26, 27, we were looking at that at last week. That hasn't come. 
right? And we need to pray for that, right? As Ezekiel, Ezekiel prayed, right? But the, the one thing we need to know is they came up and became a vast army. It is not just coming up to do nothing, coming up as, as spectators, but they became a vast army. So I want, I want to jump now uh, to continue the verse later. We'll, we'll look at what happened to the nation of Israel, even as God begins to to move, even as Ezekiel began to to pray. And I'm bringing bringing back to recent history. Or right? even as the Spirit of God began to move um, in the 1880s, we see this guy Theodor Herzl. All right? Yeah, he's he's a German uh, journalist. Um, and and um, he was a Jew, uh, but uh, from Germany, and covering the news. And that time, there was this 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 uh, terrible news about this Alfred Dreyfus affair. If you if you know your history, Alfred Dreyfus is a Jewish artillery officer in the French army. He was arrested and accused of uh, espionage, of selling French uh, army secrets to Germany. Put on trial, found guilty, and was exiled to uh, French uh, Guiana in uh, South America uh, near uh, Venezuela there, right? That's British Guiana, Dutch Guiana, and French Guiana there, all right? Um, and, and and Theodore Herzl who has been reading from the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, understanding the plight of the Jews. Everyone knows that that Dreyfus was framed, right? He was innocent. He pleaded his innocence, but because of the racist, anti-Semitic uh, climate that sprang over Europe at that time, uh, they they pushed through uh, their. Uh, what they call condemnation of uh, Dreyfus and 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 exiled him. Later, they they found the real culprit, a Frenchman, all right, and uh, they brought back the Dreyfus to be retried. And rather than convict the Frenchman, they extended the penalty to ten years and not five years. When right? there was a big uproar among the Jews in France, and the French had. To release this uh, Dreyfus, uh, the, that's the history, okay, and release him out of fear that there will be an insurrection uh, when it has already been proven who was uh, the guilty uh, person. So this, this among uh, uh, some of the anti-Semitic uh, waves that are going on, this was the, the thing that spurred uh, Theodore Herzl to pursue. Um, uh, a land for the nation of Israel, right? And and he went around gathering support of the Jewish community all over Europe, and they met in 1897 September in the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland, right? And that's when the Hatikva, the anthem, the sweet, uh, the, the the Israeli anthem, and the Magen David, the flag of uh, the shield of David was adopted and the cry the main purpose of that congress was to to fight for a homeland a specific homeland in so-called palestine for uh, the jews okay and and he was the chairperson of that congress Tiro Hussle, right? and 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 they decided to raise funds uh to help uh people to migrate back to Israel. Remember, Israel is now open. The Romans stopped Israel from returning to Israel. But when the Muslim empire came up in, uh, when Israel was under the Islamic kingdom after 639 AD, when uh, the Rashidun Caliphate took over Jerusalem, they, they revoked the Roman ban among the Jews and Jews have been returning slowly, although because the land was desolate and not many Jews dead, had the courage to go back to to try and change the desert, but the trickle started, all right. And with this Zionist movement and this cry for specific homeland, the Jews began to trickle back in the 1880s. But one spin-off is this: um, How many of you have heard of this? The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, all right? So this is a, a a paper published by by Russia actually. Um, to 
to say that this Congress of the Jews was actually a, a what we call a smoke screen for the Jews to raise up enough money to become uh, conquerors of the world through business. All right. So the Russians spread this uh, rumor uh, that the Congress wasn't fighting for the Jews to return to Palestine. It was a means to raise money uh, so that they would control uh, the commerce of the world. All right. But uh, but from there. Uh, we heard last week uh, how from there um, the sympathies of uh, certain people that got raised up, right? Uh, we look at uh, Balfour last week, uh, 1917, uh, sympathetic to the Jews, right? And, and you look at the way God moves, right? And he and the Prime Minister of England, David Lloyd George, at that time, both of them came up with this Balfour declaration to allow Jews to return, right? So, so here is Balfour, right? And uh, he, he was a prime minister of England before, but uh, after that he lost. He went back into business and he came back again uh, to become the foreign secretary. And he has a heart for the Jews, right? He is sympathetic to the Jews. He confided with them later on. And also at the same time, God raised up a new Prime Minister of England who is an evangelical Christian who is also sympathetic to the Jews. So you have two men in England, God raised up exactly at that moment to bring about this Balfour Declaration. I have much pleasure in conveying to you now, he wrote this to Baron uh, Rothschild, the head of the Anglo, uh, the, the Jewish group in England. Uh, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspiration, which has been submitted to us and approved by the cabinet. Okay, His Majesty's government, the British government, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. That's the key verse. We will favor the establishment of a national home for the Jews and will use our best endeavor to facilitate the achievement of this object. They're going to support it. However, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of other non-Jewish communities that are already in Palestine. That means they're afraid not to anger the Arabs there. I remember because there was another treaty, I told you, the Mehmehon Hussein uh, agreement that was also signed in the same year or the year before this, right? They, they promised uh, the Arabs the control of all the uh, Arab world after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so this was the declaration that uh, Arthur Balfour uh, gave to the Zionist Congress uh, in, in England. So we looked at that last week. Now God explains what he means by all these bones coming together. Okay, and he says, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, not just Judah. All right, so even though the 10 northern tribes have long gone before Judah, 200 years before Judah was taken to Babylon, 586 BC, 200 years before that, the Assyrians came under Sargon and so on and, and taken away the 10 northern tribes 200 years earlier. But now God said, this is the whole house of Israel. All of them said, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, uh, we are cut off. There is a realization there. All right, that God has abandoned them because they have neglected God, they have forgotten God. And therefore, God told Ezekiel, prophesy, thus says God, behold, O oh my people, I will open up your graves. All right, I'm going to all the valley of the dead bones. I'm going to open up wherever you have been scattered and people thought that you are dead. I'm going to open up your graves. I'm going to bring you up from your graves and bring you back into the land of Israel. So here is God as I see it. He is the latest tomb raider. All right, the tomb raider. Uh, he's going to raid their graves and free them from uh, wherever they have been scattered. So now Ezekiel knows what these bones are. He realized God is telling him, these dead bones are the whole house of Israel 
that you have seen and you being included, you have been scattered all over the world. All right, and people have been hopeless. Whenever will they return to Israel? Whenever will they have their temple back? And so on. All right, so, so God is giving to Ezekiel here a preview of what he is going to do as he now in our time has begun to do since 1948. So with the signing of the Balfour Agreement, we find more Jews started to to come back, especially from Eastern Europe and from Russia. A lot of them uh, came back from uh, that area. All right? and, uh, and these are all the pictures of it. But as I mentioned earlier on to you, all of them are speaking different languages. They speak Russian, they speak Ukrainian, all right? they speak Lithuanian, all right? uh, they speak German, most of them, all right? uh, French and so on. And, and how are they going to communicate? Okay, and uh, there was no common language uh, to bind them together. Those from Eastern Europe, they were mainly speaking Yiddish. Yiddish is a, a mixture of, of a Judean language and German. All right, so the mixture of Hebrew and German became their colloquial language, Yiddish. Just as Koine, the one that they used to write the New Testament, was a mixture of, uh, of Judean and, and Greek. Uh, uh, marketplace Greek. And so uh, different languages are difficult for people to communicate. But then you see, God moved again and brought up this guy by the name of Aliazar ben Yehuda. All right? and he is a Jewish young man, a teacher from Belarus. And uh, uh, he migrated back to Israel together with all those migrants that came back. And he realized no, you people could not understand. He began to develop the Hebrew language, the original Hebrew language, modernize it with modern artifacts, modern things, uh, creating new words, right, to reflect the modern development and so on, right? And he began to force his children and his wife, his wife is Russian, to speak only Hebrew. Don't speak Russian, don't speak Lithuanian and so on, but speak only Hebrew at home. All right, forcing his children to do all that. And slowly from that, he's supposed to die. All right, the doctor said, you have only one year to live. Uh, he had TB, uh, but God spared him until 1910, when the first Hebrew dictionary was compiled. And by his death in 1922, all 17 volumes were already done. And this is, I told you, was the world. Fulfillment of the prophecy in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. For then I will restore to the people a pure language, the language of Canaan, Hebrew, right? That they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord, with one common language. They can now uh, come together in unity and speak the old Hebrew again, which was the language that was given to the sons of uh, Adam. Okay, and uh, just to take you a little bit back on what the Jews believe. Now, Christians, uh, especially those of us who are charismatics, you look at this verse and you say, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues that was fulfilled in Pentecost. Uh, where there's a pure language of the angels and everybody can understand uh, each other when uh, Peter spoke in Acts chapter uh, 2, all right? So the church would like to interpret it that way as the baptism uh, and the speaking in, in tongues. Others will interpret it as, if you look at uh, the rest of Zephaniah chapter 3, it goes on to talk about how to speak in love, how to speak in humility. The language of God's people is different from the language of the heathen nation. There is a, a special uh, fear of God in the way we talk and so on, and especially uh, a, a language of humility. All right, so those who don't believe in, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit will translate it this way. Now, let me give you the how the Jews understand this verse. They believe that Hebrew or Ibri was the language of Seth, and uh, that language was kept pure. And when Nimrod, the son of Ham, built the Tower of Babel, gave Babel, God confused them all uh, with different languages so that they couldn't understand and spread them all over the world. And they can't come as a united force to rebel against God in the Tower of uh, Babel. Okay, 
But there was one tribe that refused to join Nimrod in this construction of the temple. That is the tribe of Eber. All right, the Eber is the father of the Hebrew uh, people. All right? The great grandfather of Abraham came from, from there. All right, so they believe that all the tribes in the world they have got different languages after this uh, Genesis chapter 11 uh, incident where God confused them uh, because of their rebellion against God. Only one tribe, the tribe of Hebrew, the Eber tribe, kept the original language of Canaan. All right, all right. So that's how the Jews interpret this. And we saw that in Isaiah chapter 19, when God said in the land of Egypt itself, in the end days, there'll be five cities, including Cairo, who will speak the language of Canaan. I mean, Hebrew is going to be an exported language as well among the end time uh, nations. They will learn up Hebrew too. Okay. And uh, that's what we saw in chapter 32. All right. So carry on what God said. He says, I'll bring my people back to the land. I'll bring them back to the land. The song that we saw last week, right? Zion, bring you back to the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves, right? Oh, my people and brought you up from them. Now he says, I will put my spirit in you. Right? And that's what we saw in Ezekiel chapter 36. A new heart, a new spirit. But that hasn't happened yet. So what you're seeing in Israel, yes, there's a breath of God in them. There's a life. They are alive. They are a great army. But the spirit of God is not in them. The heart of God. Because Ezekiel 36 says, I'll put a new heart in you. I'll put a new spirit in you. They have yet to turn to the Messiah, Yeshua. So it's only through the blood of Yeshua that when we turn to Yeshua that he said, I'll put a new heart and a new spirit in you. Okay, that's the new covenant that all of us in the church who believe in the Lord, God has given us that covenant, a new heart and a new spirit to worship him. But Jews who have not turned to Yeshua, the Messiah, we have not experienced that. But God says, I will do it. I'll do it. So we need to pray for that. Huh? Brothers, I pray that this blindness be taken away, that, that God will put that heart and a new spirit so that they are not the old Israel, but it will be a transformed Israel. So the new covenant given to the church today, that's ours because of what we believe and because of our trust and faith in the Lord. But that is actually meant for his people, the Jews, and it will only be ratified when the Jews as a nation turn to, look to the Lord in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, where God says, I will put my spirit of supplication upon them so that when they look upon whom, upon me, whom they have pierced, then they shall mourn as one who, who mourns for their firstborn. Okay, so that's Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Then the repentance comes, the new heart comes, the new spirit. Comes, right, so right now, what we are seeing here is a political, physical restoration of Israel, the first fruits, waiting for the return of Christ when there will be this complete spiritual restoration and the conversion of the nation of Israel as a whole, and then all Israel shall be saved. Now, that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 11. Okay. So, uh, take you back to what we did last week. So, this was what God has moved uh, since then in 1917 uh, by the Balfour Agreement. You have the British mandate. This was the land originally supposed to be given uh, to the Jews, but you know the Hussein uh, family protested in 1922. Wilson split this land and gave this 85% to Jordan and the remaining 25% uh, to the Jews and the Arabs that have settled in this land. Right? And then we noticed that in 1947, how uh, this animosity between the Arabs and the Jews continued for so long, right through the Second World War. And after the Second World War, the British gave up on the British mandate and surrendered the whole thing to the United Nations that was formed after World War II, 1947. The British ended their mandate in April the 29th, 1948. Immediately after that, the Jews declared 
independence, right? So, uh, so that's where I stopped last week. So I'm continuing now. So May 14, 1948, uh, Ben Gurion, okay, Ben Gurion, he's from Poland. He declared uh, independence for the nation state of Israel, and then we are told immediately, God raised up a new president in America who is also sympathetic to the Jews. Right before that was Roosevelt. So Roosevelt, Roosevelt was in the Second World War. Uh, Roosevelt died in 1945, just before the end of Second World War. Uh, God raised up uh, President Truman to be the next president after Roosevelt. Uh, he was the one who decided on the atomic bombs to be dropped in Hiroshima to end the World War. And the next major decision was when Ben Gurion declared independence, every eye was watching USA. Would US agree to that? And Truman immediately, same day, supported uh, Ben Gurion to the shock of his own uh, State Department. The State Department had warned him not to do that because they would lose the oil right, from the Arab states. All right, so immediately the Arab states embargo uh, oil exports after that. All right, this is uh, the, the other story. So we are told that immediately when Truman de uh, declared his support for Ben Gurion, the United Nations couldn't do anything. And um, so the Arabs took it upon themselves to declare war. Right? So seven nations that we looked at last week uh, began to converge on Israel the very next day and tried to destroy Israel. All right? And for the first two weeks, especially Egypt, entered into Israel, came right up to Ashkelon and Ashdod. Now, Israel had no planes, no tanks, I mean, a few old tanks uh, which are agricultural uh, tractors and so on. The moment they decided to declare independence, Ben Gurion had already ordered his people to go to Czechoslovakia to hunt for planes and tanks and so on. They were still there under training, right? Uh, to buy uh, German planes in, in Czechoslovakia that had uh, been grounded, spot, broken, and um, reconditioned by them into crates. Because what happened is this. Because of the oil embargo, America, France, England, all embargo uh, the export of weapons to Israel. So Israel wanted to buy the planes from America, but there was an embargo. They couldn't buy those planes because they want to stop this this war. So when they heard the news that uh, these people had declared war, those pilots that were under training, they are not just all Jewish pilots, they are American pilots and, other, and so on, that have volunteered uh, to help raise up a air force in the new Israel, they immediately came home, all right, with their crates pretended uh, to be agricultural equipment, okay? And they came back to, to Israel and they managed to get uh, five tanks and two planes. There were actually four planes, right? Four planes, but immediately on the first day of the war, uh, two of them got shot down. Uh, these are terrible planes. Let me show you a picture of the plane, all right? And uh, yeah, this was the plane that they had, the RVRS-199. They are all reconditioned plane. Uh, already spoke and uh, refurbished and the machine guns immediately got jammed and they had, uh, you know where, where do you put the bombs there's no place to put the bomb the bomb was on the pilot's lap all right and flew over the egyptian tank columns look at the tanks and take up the bomb and drop the bomb by hand over the tanks and on the first day of the war only on the first day that they came back the plane they had only two left two were shot and so there was these two planes and five tanks that they had uh, in the war. Of course, later uh, the, they ordered 25 planes and they got to smuggle them in uh, slowly, right? So the two, and with the two planes and the five tanks that they had, they stopped the advance of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan into Israel. It's, it's a great miracle. Right. Two broken plates whose machine guns are jammed and so on. Remember the two fish and the five loaves of bread in John chapter 5, right? Two with two fish and five loaves of bread. There was a great miracle there in John chapter 5, right? So here is it again with two, two planes and five uh, tanks. They won the war. All right. So, of course, uh, later on in July, by July, they got three bombers to come in and Israel bought them from Czechoslovakia. 
thank God, Czechoslovakia, um, sympathetic to the Jews, although sold them at a very high price, but defy the sanction, uh, defy the embargo, all right, and allow Israel to bring back all these planes. And they had three of these bombers by July and so on, all right? So uh, go and read that. I'll give you this article. You'll find whatever I mentioned to you, they are here from four planes to two and the uh, very next week they lost another one so they they are left with one plane uh in the end but 25 were on the way coming in okay so here we see the hand of god all right the promises of god is always yeah and amen yes in him that is why israel needs to turn to god to know that there's nothing short of the miracle of god that has kept them and preserved them right because god is faithful he'll do what he says he'll do what he has promised to Abraham. Things may look otherwise completely impossible to the human mind, but to God, all right? The, he, he is the God of the uh, impossible, all right? So we are going to look at how the hand of God keep moving uh, uh, into the next uh, season when we go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 38 and 39, the God, we may go war, and after that, okay. So now let me carry on to something new today. In 1967, there was a new man in Egypt by the name of Gamal Nasser. Gamal Abdul Nasser is a new president in Egypt. He wants to be the champion of the Islamic uh, group in the Middle East to destroy Israel. 1956, he blocked up this the Straits of Tehran here. This is the Straits of Tehran, and this is the port of Eilat uh, for Israel, the only port that would grant uh, access into the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, okay, to the east. And Nasser blocked up this Straits of Tehran, will not allow any Israeli ship to pass through. 1956, he did that. And immediately he got the support of all the Arabic uh, nations, but Israel immediately attacked Egypt in 1956, took over all this area, the Sinai Peninsula, took over even the Suez Canal, so that Israel has access to both the ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. But again, America came in and forced Israel to, to withdraw. Right? Uh, Israel said, okay, we'll withdraw on the condition that Nasser doesn't block this our lifeline again. All right, but 1967, he threatened to do the same thing again, and he got young Hussein, right, the present king of Jordan's father, King Hussein, and Hafez Assad, uh, the father of today's Bashir Assad, to Assad to join forces to attack Israel. 1967, all right, and that is known as the uh, 1967 war. But Israel heard of this. Israel heard of this and Israel had a preemptive attack on Egypt. Right? So uh, Israel by that time had more than 250 planes already. So they flew 200 planes into Egypt at 7 a.m. in the morning while the Egyptian pilots were still sleeping and having their breakfast and bombed out all the planes in Egypt before they could take off. All right, and Jordan didn't even realize that Jordan came in with their tanks, Syria came in with the tanks, and Israel now was left with two fronts, and they managed to push back Syria and push back uh, King Hussein of Jordan. Okay, and uh, that's the six day war. Okay, so here is it Saudi Arabia, King Hussein, Hafez Assad, and Nasser. All right, the six day war. And uh, who were the heroes in uh, Israel? Uh, we have Bushi Dayan, the one-armed bandit, all right? He is the uh, Minister of Defense in Israel. And this Tom Hanks here, which is uh, Ijat Rabin, a very famous guy. Uh, he is the Chief of Staff and the Prime Minister at that time was Levi Eshkel, all right? So it was a miraculous war uh, where Israel defeated all these three armies of uh, Syria, Jordan, and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, including Iraq and others that led in support in aircraft and so on, okay? And uh, so you find that what happened was Israel took all of the West Bank in 1967, took Golan Heights from Syria, 
took the entire Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. And the territory of Israel became four times larger than what it was uh, after the uh, 151 partition plan of the United Nations. Okay, Now you have more refugees from the West Bank all crowding into Jordan. So now you have, last time was 700,000 refugees in the Independence War, plus another 850 refugees uh, from uh, Gaza and West Bank. Now you have 1.5 million Palestinian refugees crowded around uh, this area. Okay, big problem. Now, what happened is this. The war was God's victory. But because of the, the joy of the victory of their commanders, despite all the mishaps and blunders, uh, they began to glorify themselves, self-confidence. They began to give medals of honor to Moshe Dayan and all the victorious generals, including Bibi Netanyahu and, and, and so on. They were all involved in this war. That time Bibi Netanyahu was just a, a captain there, right? And for the first time, they captured uh, the Temple Mount. They entered into the Temple Mount after 2,500 years. All right, Temple Mount returned to the Jews, the Wailing Wall. You can see some of them crying there when they returned back to their promised land, right? That God has given to, to them. So, so that's where the problem begins. They began to trust in themselves. That confidence, that joyful victory that they had. Uh, Psalms 20 verse 7 is a warning. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But God's people, you are to trust in the name of the Lord our God. As David taught, okay, when he went to Goliath, how dare you come against the armies of the Lord, not the armies of King Saul, okay? How dare you come against the armies of the Lord God of Israel? That's what uh, uh, David was shouting when he went to Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. All right, so Israel began to honor their generals and they forgot to honor and we see the same thing happening today. Right? Israel is the mightiest army in the Middle East today. Everyone now dare not touch Israel because of the military might that Israel has. Uh, only Iran today dares to challenge uh, Israel, but we need to pray. Yes, armaments and, and military might is necessary for Israel's survival, but Israel must learn to trust God first. And that is where we as a church should uphold uh, Israel. Let them not steal that glory and that honor from God. It's God who gave them this miraculous victory. So after that, because of their pride, you find that they began to trust in their military intelligence and in their military might. They forgot. And they forgot that Gamal Nasser is still being championing the Islamic objective to retake back all the land of the Muslims, uh, Ottoman Empire. So instead of now engaging Israel in war, because Israel is now a strong army, they began the war of attrition to wear down, because they know that Israel's army are all made of reservists. There is no real army of such. They began to harass and ambush and attack civilians instead of declaring full-scale war. So this is a guerrilla warfare, a war of attrition, and Russia. When Israel declared independence, Russia was very hopeful that Israel would become a communist uh, empire, become a communist nation. Uh, Russia was supportive of Israel in the beginning, but later, when America came in, Russia began to support the other nation. So Russia was supplying all the armaments to Nasser, Nasser from Egypt, and even trained all their pilots and even had Russian pilots being trained in Cairo, or I mean, a training uh, station in, in Cairo. All right? So this war of attrition uh, from uh, 1967 onwards cost uh, 1,500 soldiers of Israel killed. All right, KIA is uh, killed in action. All right, so they, they do ambush, wear out the 
is very fortunate. In 1969, Levi Eshkol died of heart attack, and the fourth Prime Minister, Golda Meir, a lady Prime Minister, a teacher, uh, became the Prime Minister of Israel. Then began the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Again, uh, Syria and Egypt, uh, Lebanon, and so on. But Jordan, Jordan stayed out. Hussein, he was young when he was mesmerized by this Nasser from Egypt. And uh, he was forced to, by Nasser to join the 1967 war, and they lost. But by 1973, he has a change in mind and he stayed out of the war. In fact, he warned Golda Meir, be careful, this Nasser is coming again. But you see, the pride of Israel that time didn't realize the danger. Hussein specially flew into Israel to warn Israel, be careful, Syria and Egypt is coming again. And the attack during Yom Kippur, which is the holiest month, in uh, October, the, the Feast of Atonement, when all of Israel was uh, in repentance, uh, um, so they were caught unprepared. So Syria took the Golan Heights. Egypt took back Sinai. They lost it. Israel lost it. And uh, Moshe Dayan, Moshe Dayan, you remember the one that guy? He saw, he was the Minister of Defense then, and he saw there was no hope for Israel. He came up to this to Golda Meir and says, if we do not get help from America, America refused to help. But Russia came in, you see, Russia came in to help Egypt. And Golda Meir told President Nixon at that time, if you don't help, we are losing this battle. We will use our atom bomb. Yeah. Moshi Dayan advised Golda Meir, there is no choice left. Okay, the temple is gone. He told Golda Meir, we have lost the temple again. And the only choice left is the Samson option. You know what's the Samson option? How did Samson die? How did Samson defeat the Philistines? He had to kill himself by pushing the, the pillars of the temple, let the pillars collapse on him and all the, the nobles of the Philistines were killed. So the Samson option was Israel would sacrifice itself by using the A-bomb. Israel already got an A-bomb then. All right, and Golda Meir warned Nixon, you don't supply us, Russia is going to come in. So Nixon hurriedly you know, began to send supplies of planes and tanks back to Israel. Israel had depleted. There was nothing left. All their planes and tanks were gone, destroyed in the surprise attack. Okay, and with that, miracles began to happen all right those of you who want to know all the miracles that happened during the six day war and the yam kippur war all right please look at this uh website i've given to you all right i just give you two all right the egyptian were invading uh came into israel already and suddenly the whole platoon of egyptian soldiers surrendered to one remaining israeli soldier the entire egyptian force laid down their arms and surrendered to just one soldier left, all right? And later, they all came to the camp. Uh, the soldier let them, uh, prisoners came, and they were asking, why do you surrender to this soldier? All right, he's the low, uh, only one soldier left. And the Egyptians were shocked. They said, we didn't see one soldier. All right, we saw a great army behind him, just as what happened to Elisha, all right? We saw they who are for us is greater than they who are against us. Right, so this is the miracle that happened. Another one was uh, Commander uh, David Eni. Right, they went into Syria. They overextended, and and they realized that they didn't have enough reinforcement backing them, and they were trapped in Syria. They would die. So their commander David Eni asked them to retreat quickly. They retreated, and to their horror, they found out they were trapped in a minefield. They couldn't advance dangerous all right they got lost into a minefield and the order was for them to dig into the soil 30 inches deep to uncover any landmines so that they weave, they weave their way through the minefield one soldier prayed one soldier who know god began to pray what happened was immediately there was a sandstorm that swept away 30 inches of the top soil exposing all the landmines and when the storm was over, they could see where all the mines were 
and, and they managed to escape before uh, the Syrian army uh, came in the morning to destroy them. So uh, just, just two beautiful miracles that came in. A lot of them are listed in this uh, forum there, just to let you know. All right. After the war, uh, they won the war miraculously with God's hand. And uh, Golda Meir resigned because she took the blame uh, for the unpreparedness of the war. And uh, Isaac Rabin became the new prime minister, Isaac Rabin. He was prime minister of Israel twice. And this is the guy that brought in peace. If Israel needs anyone today, I, I believe it's people like Isaac Rabin, who is able to negotiate with the PLO uh, Palestinian for some form of uh, self-rule and so on, but yet not giving them uh, the government of the land because this is God's land. All Israel is aware of that, uh, but still allow them some some autonomy to be able to make their own civil decisions. Now he is the one who began to work towards a peace treaty with the new uh, president of Egypt, which is Anwar Sadat. He knew Anwar Sadat is not like Nasser, and it, the two of them began to work together and pave the way for the Camp David Accords in 1970. Hey, so by the time this was signed, uh, there was a new prime minister in Israel, Manakhan Begin, and Anwar Sadat signed the Camp David Accord. There was a peace between Egypt and Israel in 1979, right? The peace accord was signed. And um, you find that by 1982, Israel returned all of the Sinai Desert to Egypt. And until today, all right, there is a peace between Egypt and Israel. All right, today's general, uh, Sisi, I told you when you look at Ezekiel chapter 32, uh, works together with uh, Netanyahu to ensure that the southern front of Israel is not disturbed by the ISIS terrorists that have based in Sinai. Egypt take it upon themselves to destroy the ISIS camps in Sinai itself. All right, so, so there is trust between Egypt and Israel today. Yeah? But Israel did not give up Golden Heights that it took back in 1967, right? Uh, 73, they took it back also after the war, remember? David Yanni and so on. And because it, Syria continued to be uh, bombing Israel from the Golden Heights. So Golden Heights being a mountain ridge, strategic area for Israel and Israel still hold on to uh, both uh, West Bank and the Golden Heights today, okay? All right. So that's where we are at. Now, after the 1973 war, within three years, this man came up. All of you know who this guy is, Yasser Arafat, based in Lebanon. Uh, he is in charge of the uh, PLO, right? And they began this war of attrition, Lebanon war, they were not fighting Israel's army, but uh, killing civilians, hurting Israel that way, uh, ambushing Israel, hijacking buses. And there was one bus with 34 Jewish uh, uh, passengers inside. They kill all the passengers using uh, suicide bombers and so on, hijack uh, the Israeli airlines, the Transworld Airlines. So that was a time when airplane hijacking began. His base was in Lebanon and Israel was forced to enter into the Lebanon war uh, to oust him, right? To throw him out because his PLO base was in, was in Lebanon, all right? Throw him out, force him to leave Lebanon to go to Tunisia, right? That was what happened, right? But he set up his base in, in Tunisia uh, instead, okay? And Lebanon instead was taken over by this guy, Nasarallah, up to today. So I'm bringing you up to today how um, now the, uh, what do you call the Hezbollah uh, has taken over Lebanon to continue this war of attrition uh, against Israel. Now let's come back to Isaac Rabin. When Isaac Rabin was uh, elected prime minister for his second term in 1992. Now remember, he was the one that brought about the peace treaty with Egypt. Now he began working again with Yasser Arafat. Right to dismantle the PLO and giving you recognition to stay in the West Bank as Arab citizens staying under 
uh, Israeli protection. And uh, Yassi agreed, right? So that was the Oslo Accords. Of course, Clinton picked the glory, but actually America did nothing, right? It was between these two guys, Rabin and, and Yasser Arafat. And later on, Yasser Rabin again worked with King Hussein. So there is a treaty of peace with King Hussein in 1994. Right, so now Israel has peace treaty with Jordan, with King Hussein, the father of King Abdullah today, and also with Egypt. There was an agreement with the PLO, but uh, both sides uh, didn't want the Oslo Accord. And because of his agreement with Yasser Arafat, he was assassinated in 1995 by a rightist Jew, not a Palestinian. He was killed by his own Jewish religious uh, zealot who saw uh, the giving of rights to the PLO to take over and have autonomy in the West Bank as defiance of God's law in, uh, in Leviticus 25, okay? So this is a little bit of uh, history there. And then began the Intifada, all right? The war of resistance. Yes grinding Israel down with uh, suicide bombers and ambushes and so on. And there have been three intifadas uh, since that time, right? Although Ehud Barak, after Ishak Rabin, tried to restore the Oslo Accords, again, you know, the leaders are good, right? Both Yasser Arafat, uh, Ishak Rabin, uh, Ehud Barak, they are trying to bring about peace to the land of Israel by allowing the Arabs to settle there all right, uh, by not giving them the government, but settle in peace. And uh, Israel has got to do a lot more, admittedly, but, but it's the religious groups underneath it, the zealous group that began to destroy whatever groundwork that has been laid. And that's happening to, to today, all right? So this is the Intifada group that would not want peace. All right, so we have three um, uh, intifadas uh, today, up to today. The third one is the Hamas. Although it's not officially gazetted as uh, intifada, but uh, Hamas has taken over the PLO uh, in Gaza and now is a king in Gaza, uh, creating all sort of uh, uh, trouble for, for Israel, okay? But as I mentioned, uh, God's hand is there. God promised, I'll bring you back and you will not be taken out again all right so god israel and jerusalem still exist today despite all these skirmishes only by the hand of god okay so i'm giving you a verse here that jeremiah says this thus says god who gives a sun for light by day and fixed order of the moon and stars by night who stirs up the seas so that its waves roar the lord is the one who made all this creation it is his name and God says, if this fixed order of the sun, the moon, the waves, stars, if this fixed order departs before me, that means when there's chaos in the universe creation, in the created universe, then the offspring of Israel will also cease. As long as the sun rises in the east, as long as the moon continues to give its light, as long as the stars are there in the sky and not being swept away, Israel will continue to exist as a nation before me. Just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, the word of the Lord shall not disappear, okay? Until the fixed order of the universe is being destroyed. Jesus said the same thing regarding the word of God. His father, God, said the same thing regarding his bride, the nation of Israel, okay? So yes, Israel will continue to go through a lot of trouble, especially Jerusalem. Let me bring you to Jerusalem quickly. God mentions this and we pray for Jerusalem, but we know what's going to happen, all right? Because the word of God says this. So pray intelligently, pray for the purposes of God, pray especially for the people of Israel and in Jerusalem to fear God. Israel will be surrounded. Israel will be taken. We know that. Two-thirds of Israel will be destroyed. We know that. All that is God's scripture. We can't change the purposes of God there, but we can change the heart of the people. Praying for God's spirit to work that, that they may turn to God. 
right, for their ultimate salvation. So God says in, in Zechariah chapter 12 here, verse 2, go and read Zechariah chapter 12, up to chapter 14. Huh? Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people around. When the siege is against Judah and Jerusalem. We'll look at that in the next session uh, in June, when the Gog and Magog war, the siege on Judah and Jerusalem. And in that day, God says, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. Whoever tried to dislodge Jerusalem, all that burden themselves shall be cut in pieces, God said. These are enemy nations. Though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, so whenever you see the word in that day, this is talking about the day of Christ's return. In that day, I will smite every horse of the goat and Magog that's coming with astonishment. The kings of the east that's coming in the sixth bowl, all right, uh, to the Euphrates. I will smite every horse with astonishment, his rider with madness. There's going to be confusion among all the enemies. We are going to look at that later. I will wash over the house of Judah. And I will smite every horse of the people with blindness, those who come against Jerusalem. Bring you back to modern history in that day. The end days. We are living in it now. All the nations of the earth will gather against Jerusalem, but God will give Judah the strength and Judah will uh, prevail. Okay, let's look at this guy, President Obama. He has been against Netanyahu all the while. He couldn't stand Netanyahu. And uh, before he left the presidency in his last week in November 2016, he allowed the United Nations to pass 12 resolutions against Israel, forcing Israel to return Jerusalem or East Jerusalem uh, back to the Palestine. And for the first time in America's history, they refused to use their veto against this resolution. That means this is, all these resolutions are supported by Obama through his, ambas her, his ambassador Samantha power in United Nations. Didn't lift up the head. Allow all the Security Council to pass all these resolutions against Israel. Then comes the next year, 1970, exactly 12 months after this, President Trump declared Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Immediately, he was the darling of uh, Netanyahu. They declare him as Cyrus the third. Okay, King Cyrus was the one that saved Israel, allowed Israel to come back. He is Cyrus the first. Cyrus the second was President Truman, who immediately recognized Israel. They declared Truman as Cyrus the second, and Trump is King Cyrus uh, the third. They even had a gold coin uh, with uh, Trump's head and King uh, Cyrus' head uh, to commemorate uh, the day when Trump declared Jerusalem as the capital. Now, immediately on 6 December, the day after President Adawan of Turkey convened all the organization of Islamic countries, 57 Islamic countries, including Malaysia, to declare Jerusalem the capital of Palestine to veto President Trump's uh, declaration. The whole thing came to the United Nations Security Council and Nikki Haley, right? The darling of Israel is the only vote that vetoed President Erdogan's uh, move to bring back Jerusalem under the Islamic uh, nation, okay? So in the United Nations Security Council, it was a 14 to one vote. Every 15 nations of the Security Council voted against Jerusalem. Only Nikki Haley vetoed that, right? It was brought to the United Nations General Assembly. One to eight of the 137 countries voted to get Jerusalem back to the Palestine. Only nine countries go against that. Small, small countries like Honduras, um, uh, Micronesia, and all these things, okay? Including America. Those abstain is England, Canada, Australia and so on, okay? So Jerusalem will not be surrendered back to the Palestine, whatever happens. The ambassador, the Israeli ambassador to the UN said, the UN council can vote again and again, a hundred more times again. It will not change the simple fact that Jerusalem is, has been, and always will be the capital of all 
Israel. That's from the ambassador. But let's see what God says. All right. God said this in Second Chronicles. When King Solomon, after the dedication of the, the temple, the first temple that Solomon built, he, he says this. Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, Solomon quoting God here. I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel where which I can build a house for my name, that my name might be there. I chose no man as the prince over my people Israel. But today I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now that's God's pronouncement. Jerusalem will be his eternal capital forever. David will be the prince over his people forever. We have been looking at that since the last week. Okay, now let's quickly, uh, the last part of Ezekiel 37, where he brings unity back to God's people. Huh? So the word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, take a stick of wood, take one stick right on it belonging to Judah and all the Israelites under Judah, then take another piece of wood and right of it belonging to Joseph, Ephraim, which represents all the Israelites of the 10 northern tribes and join the two together into one stick so that they become one stick in your hand. So, so the people are going to ask Ezekiel, what, what do you mean by this? Uh, putting the name of Judah in one stick and putting Ephraim on the other hand and God told, when your people ask you, would you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph which is in Ephraim's hand, which is the 10 northern tribes, and all of the 10 northern tribes associated with him, and I'm going to join it with Judah's stick, the southern kingdom, and I'll make them into one single stick of wood that they will become one in my hand, and hold those uh, joints stick together uh, before their eyes. Now, I want you to look at the cross of Calvary. It's actually two sticks also. There's the transept and there is the main, uh, what do you call, timber there. And they are joined together to form the cross. And in the cross, both the Jews and the Gentiles are joined together. Just as the two sticks are joined together for the northern and the southern tribe of Israel. So God would restore them all as once. Right, since their breakaway, since 930 BC, right, under King Solomon, 930 BC, after Solomon died, the northern tribes have gone under Jeroboam, uh, and uh, southern tribe was under Rehoboam. So Israel has been split since 930 BC. It's 3,000 years now, and God is going to join them all under one king. And say to them, this is what God says, I will take the Israelites, whether northern tribes or southern tribes, wherever they have gone, I'll gather them from all around and bring them back in their own land. So we're back to last week's uh, Ezekiel 36. I, then I'll make them one nation, one nation in mountains of Israel, and there will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with the idols and images and all the offenses and I will save them from all uh, their sins and I will cleanse them and they will be my people and I will be their God. So this is the future, all right, where they're going to restore them. So uh, this is what we looked at last week. I'm just going to repeat it, um, how this restoration will come about and it says, I'll pour out on the house of David on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Remember this verse by heart, Zechariah 12, 10. The spirit of grace, God's Holy Spirit, and of supplication. That is the only time to bring back the nation of Israel as one. When they will look on me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him. All right, and verse 26, last week we looked at, oh, then I will give you that new heart. So when there is this realization, Baruch Basham Adonai, when they saw Christ returning, they will realize that they will mourn, and then God says, I will give you a new heart. Only upon repentance does that happen. It has, praise God, it has happened to us when we turn to the Lord, God give us this new covenant, but remember this new covenant is for Israel. 
it will only be ratified when Christ returns. A new heart, a new spirit. And I will remove that heart of stone. I'll put in you a new heart of flesh. Then we'll become a new Israel. All right, so far, all the dead bones are still, I told you just now, it is still the old Israel, the old flesh. Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, the old self that we are. All right, and God's going to break all that, give us a new answer that today uh, we are born again, everything is made new, we are a new creation in God. That hasn't happened to Israel until the day when Christ returns. And then God says, I'm going to put a new spirit. Both the northern and the southern will be joined together in one. And that is the fulfillment in Psalms 133. How good it is when God's people live together in unity. Okay, then he says, my servant. So we come back to the story of David. All right, David will be resurrected in the first resurrection. Will be king over them. My servant David. Now I know some of you kept saying that this is talking about the Messiah. But look. There are a lot of scriptures that talk about David himself, my servant, having a meal together with his Lord, which is Yeshua, right? So this is talking of two different people here, okay? And we're going to look at that when we come back in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 43, when David will enter into the Holy of Holies, uh, bringing sacrifices of thanksgiving to the Lord. Yes, David is a servant again, okay, right? David will be king over the Jews, uh, but Yeshua will be the king of kings. It's a different title, all right? So my servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. We saw that in Ezekiel 34, under the return of the good shepherd. And they will follow my laws, again, with a new heart and new spirit, careful to keep my decrees. Uh, they will live in the land that I have given my servant Jacob, all the 12 tribes, all right, the promised land. They and their children and their children, children will live there forever. This is an everlasting uh, covenant. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. Ezekiel always used human kings as prince. All right? So the, he used the word king only for the king of kings, the lord of lords. Right? And... King David will now, the promise of uh, Isaiah 55, all those verses, go and read the four verses there. Uh, he will again rule over Israel that God has promised him, right? Go and read Hosea. I wouldn't have time anymore. And then he say, I'll make a covenant of peace. Now that covenant of peace that has now been blessed uh, for the church, he will make a, that covenant of peace, ratify the covenant of peace with Israel. Then there shall be real peace, the true shalom between God and his uh, people. I will establish them, increase their numbers. I'll put my sanctuary among them forever. God is going to rebuild the people, are going to rebuild the Ezekiel's temple. Uh, we are going to look that over three chapters, chapter 40 to 43, uh, when we come back next season, all right? Um, something indispensable to the Jews. We will debate on whether it's necessary for Christians, all right, uh, when we come to that. So my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, have made Israel holy and my sanctuary will be with them forever, okay? I praise the Lord, okay? So now, all this is regarding with Israel. Let me quickly try and see what we can draw to apply for ourselves the church. I'm just trying to draw some lessons that takeaways for us because all the time I've been stressing on Israel uh, because of uh, Israel's uh, uh, Independence Day this week and so on. All right. Now, even as we move among the people who have yet to know God, let's picture like Ezekiel. We are moving among dead bones. People who have been dead to Christ. We are actually walking among the living dead. Okay, we can use that term. And uh, we need to be aware that these are dead bones that God said, it is not my pleasure that I should lose any of them, that any of these bones should perish. So like Ezekiel, we need to hear what's God's call. God has already called us to go into the ends of the earth, to preach and to disciple all nations. That's what God has asked us. 
And therefore, it is the onus given to us to bring about God's word. Even as Ezekiel was asked to prophesy God's word, speak to these bones. So we, we need to have this childlike confidence in God, even as Ezekiel had that. Because Jesus told us this, Lo and behold, my authority is with you, even to the ends of the age. Go in the authority of my name. That's what Christ has given to us. And like Ezekiel, we need to, to obey. And even as we speak the word of God, again, we are asked to remember it is the spirit. It is the spirit that brings about the conviction of his judgment and righteousness on the people. And therefore, we need to also pray as we share the word of God, as a wife shares the word of God, the husband be there to support the wife in prayer, which I always do whenever we go out, you know, and Sue Ling is sharing the word of God, I'll be upholding her, that the spirit will speak through her, all right? And we need to do that. We need to go out in pairs, supporting one another and understand that the Holy Spirit works. And there's a process in that, even as Ezekiel watches, you keep watch how God moves in this family. Don't give up hope, all right? Ezekiel never gave up hope. These are dry bones beyond, beyond any possibility of being raised. And yet he kept watching for God's move to bring up the bones. Every move that the Holy Spirit moved among the bones. And we need to be aware of that. Don't, don't lose hope. It's not God's wish that any should perish. And uh, then be part of this great movement of God to revive them, to disciple them into an army of service for God. Okay, so so that's that's where we could draw some uh, takeaways for, for the church. So Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for this lovely word that you have given to us, Lord, that uh, uh, you have been faithful, you have been long-suffering, you have been uh, patient uh, with your people in Israel and your promises to Israel have never been abolished. You know, right? My word shall never return to be empty. And we are thankful this evening and over the last few weeks to see the fulfillment of every promise that you have given uh, to this uh, nation of your people. And we are Assured too, Lord, that the same promises are given to us. Every promise that you have given the church uh, to be your bride in the end, that too will be fulfilled. And we take comfort in the fact that even you do not disregard the promises to your people, you will also not disregard your promises to us, uh, your church, for all your promises are yea and, and amen. And so, Father, we take heart in that promise and we ask Lord that um, even as you have blessed us with this new covenant given to us a new heart and a new spirit etched in the blood of Christ at Calvary uh, we, we bless you and we thank you for this covenant relationship that we have with Christ as his bride right now Lord as a group here uh, we, we uphold your people we uphold your people and Israel and your people who are still scattered all over the world, that they too will come to the realization of the new covenant that you have for them, that they too can look forward to the day when this new heart and new spirit that you have promised to them will really be given to them. It's theirs, it's theirs. And according to Paul, we are just foreign branches that have been grafted by your grace into this covenant that you have given to Abraham, that the blessings that you have given to us may cause your people in Israel to be envious and to also look for that blessing. And so right now, Father, we pray. We pray that the blessing that you have given to us, the heart, the spirit that you have given to us, we share, Lord, with your people in Israel, that they too will be convicted by your spirit, your spirit of supplication, your spirit of grace and mercy, and turn as a whole nation back to you. We look forward to your return, Lord, in glory and power, Lord, 
and the way that you are going to marvelously bring back your people as one nation under you. We thank you in the name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.